A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Whelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. A new school year and new leadership at the city's largest school district and the little cars with the loud engines ready to take to the streets in the cities. It's 25 years of go-karting in the cities as the Grand Prix takes to the streets of Rock Island once again. More on that later, but first, new leadership at Davenport Schools. Davenport's choice for superintendent is finally on the job, but it took weeks to resolve uncertainty due to Iowa School Administration licensing requirements, and he has plenty of challenges to face even from day one. And joining us right now is Dr. Robert Kobilski, the Davenport School Superintendent. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Danport Schools opened earlier this week. What was your first impression as all the kids started filling those classrooms you now lead? Job well done. <laughs> um, I had an opportunity to meet uh, the entire staff. Uh, I made it a point to introduce myself to um, every single employee in the district in, in two large settings um, at Davenport West High School. And I very much appreciated the enthusiasm um, and energy that was on display by our staff. And clearly that manifested itself into uh, an awesome first day of school. The kids had that same energy and we're off to a great start this year. But as you know the district is heading uh, actually is facing headwinds right now. I mean either it's, it's, it's budget issues or it has to do with some state regulations and and how the uh, school district has operated. You knew that coming in. Certainly. What, what is your major plans? I mean what, what is task one? Well, first and foremost, uh, we're in the education business, so student achievement is job one, and that's going to be our focus moving forward. Having said that, certainly there have been, as you said, some headwinds that the district has had to encounter over the course of the last few months and, and actually over a year now. Um, we have action plans in place both from a budgetary standpoint, um, also from an academic standpoint, um, and, and also making sure that we're meeting the needs of our students all along the way. So plans are in place. We're moving forward um, with a great sense of urgency and I'm confident that we'll continue to be um, everything that our community expects from our school system. You come from a very different school district, uh, Nicolay High School and uh, the Bay Point area, the northern or mm -hmm. Fox Point, the northern part Correct. of Milwaukee, an affluent area. Mm -hmm. uh, that district was one of the top in Wisconsin for per pupil spending. Right. Damport very different than that. I mean, it, it's, it's really a sea change for you. Um, in, in that regard, yes. Uh, actually, I began my career in the Chicago public school system, so I had 10 years in a, in a large urban environment, and um, two of my other superintendencies were in um, uh, districts that were not nearly as affluent and didn't have the opportunities that we had in Fox Point Bayside. But um, there are certain immutable tenants in education that apply in multiple contexts, and accelerating the achievement of every student in every classroom every day the way we do that works in multiple systems. Now certainly there are um, additional challenges here in Davenport, especially with the uh, the budget scenario that you described, the citations that have been put forward by the uh, state. We're working on all of those, but again, we have a plan of action and I'm confident that we're going to work through all of those. As a matter of fact, all of August, we worked through our August citations, and uh, we had 15 citations that were due by the end of August. Those have already been completed and signed off on by the state. So we're well on our way to, 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 to having, again, the quality school system that our community expects. You have a feeling that the uh, Davenport School Board was looking for an outsider, so to speak, somebody who could drive the district forward, somebody that has new thoughts or a new perspective. Is that the way you see your role? In a lot of ways, you know, many times uh, when you see problems and you work on them um, for a period of time, uh, the answer might be right in front of you and you don't see it. And, and that fresh lens, that fresh set of eyes, usually lends itself to some creative thinking and some uh, divergent solutions that might not be evident to people that have been staring at the situation for a long time. So given my broad background, both um, in the private sector, as well as the superintendencies and administrative and teaching background that I've had in the past, plus the um, academic background that I've had at Loyola University, I think all those pieces put together um, gave the school board confidence that I had the skill set to come in and help work through some of the headwinds you've been discovering. One of the other headwinds, so to speak, has to do with enrollment. We're seeing declining enrollment in the Davenport schools. Really significant when you can see some of the increases in surrounding school districts, not so much in this urban district of, of right. Davenport. 
how can you turn that around when you, when you have uh, uh, an area that the schools are getting older, the neighborhoods are getting older, and people aren't necessarily living in Davenport proper? Well, the key is we have to provide values so that families see um, the Davenport school system as a destination school district where they would like their children to attend. That's dependent upon us producing the academic, social, and emotional results that those families would like to see um, imparted upon their children. So that's the work that we have ahead of us. We have to build trust and confidence in not only our community, but in surrounding communities so that as people are choosing where to live, Davenport will be a district of uh, a district destination that um, really accommodates all those family needs. But at the end of the day, the proof is in the data. We have to have the achievement results, and we have to have the social and, and, and emotional learning that um, our community expects also. Have you noticed a real groundswell as far as the community is concerned for the success of Davenport schools? And I point out that there's a number of uh, civic groups, United Way has groups, that are all trying to find ways to better the education experience in the Quad Cities, Davenport in particular. One of the most poignant experiences I had during the interview process is I, I really sensed the theme. I interviewed with over 120 individuals and a number of different groups within Davenport to, 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 to vet this process. Every single one of those groups, you could tell that there was a sense of, we want to roll up our sleeves. How can we help the Davenport school system become um, a better school system? And knowing that we had those legions of, of volunteers out there that were willing to, like I said, roll up their sleeves and help us out, gave me confidence that when the offer came that uh, this is the place that I wanted to be. You take a look at school districts all across the nation and how they are trying to adapt to the way America is right now. Are we getting away from neighborhood schools for the elementary level? Are, are we changing at, at, at all our focus as far as the brick and mortar is concerned when it comes to America's schools, Davenport in particular? Well, certainly, you know, digital, our digital world has expanded our opportunities from an educational perspective. Um, but at the same time, I think our students need a sense of belonging. Um, they're maturing and from a uh, adolescent and, and childhood development standpoint, um, having that sense of belonging within community I think is very important. Traditionally schools have served as the hub of their local neighborhood or their community and I still think that's a vital function of, of our school system and a vital service to our nation. We were talking to another Wisconsinite, Dr. Reginald Lawrence, who's the new superintendent in Rock Island, also from uh, Milwaukee Correct. Schools. He was really pointing out the fact that it used to be that you would try to get the child to conform to the school to create their better future. Now it's more the school district trying to find out what the kid needs in order to have a better life after graduation. It, uh, you're shaking your head in the affirmative, which must mean that you agree with this, but how is that going to be done in Davenport? Well, he's absolutely right. We've, we've had a legacy model of education in the past where students were asked to conform to the model of education. We've now um, uh, transitioned ourselves so that we have a personalized learning approach so that uh, the needs of the student are really what's foremost in the mind of our, of our educators and teachers in particular. So, for example, um, in the old days when, when, when I was in school or when you were in school, the to the middle and everyone would would absorb the information they need. Nowadays our teachers have to have a very robust toolbox of instructional tools that allows them to um, engage students in multiple ways, represent information in multiple ways, and give students opportunities to express their knowledge in multiple ways. So that personalized learning is, is really the new model that we're enacting and fundamentally it's based upon the teacher's ability to to reach a more diverse learning environment. There's been so much emphasis on STEM, the science, technology, Correct. engineering, and mathematics programs. Is that something that you see continuing? I mean, is it making a difference already that it needs to be uh, continued, or, or do you see that there's other alternatives out there? Well, our goal is to have college and career readiness in place for every single one of our students. And, and for many of our students, STEM is, is part of their future vision. Um, but it's not the only part of it. So, you know, whether it's robotics and engineering and, and science and math, we're certainly going to emphasize those opportunities, present them with authentic and relevant opportunities to have apprenticeships and work with our local partners. But at the same time, you know, we, we're a comprehensive system. We have to make sure that students that are interested in the performing arts, the broadcast arts, are well versed to to pursue pursue whatever the opportunities are from a post secondary perspective. I was going to say because STEM has now become STEAM, adding the A for arts. I mean, that Absolutely. was really overlooked in a lot of people's minds. Absolutely, and so our our goal is to make sure that there's a program or options for students 
whatever their interest happens to be and to nurture those interests with opportunities that are uh, educational and those that are definitely opportunities that will situate them for future success. One of the areas that you did talk about and had to do with the state citations has to do with the fact that Davenport's a very diverse school district. You have a number of African Americans, you have children with disabilities, all districts have that. True. But that was two of the areas where the uh, uh, state inspectors found Davenport lacking. Can you address those two particular areas when it comes to the African American parent who has a child going to school and believes that child might be treated differently? Two things that, that I would emphasize and that I would say to our parents. Um, when I met with the staff last week, we talked about student achievement being job one, with all meaning all. Every single student is entitled to um, um, the education that will allow them to grow. But it's so important that we have high expectations. Uh, the message that I had for the staff was, if we set the bar too low for expectations, we just might hit that bar. So we need to set the bar as high as we possibly can and have high expectations for every single one of our students. The other piece is uh, we need to get away from sorting our students. We've done a very good job um, of, of sorting students from an academic perspective. We need to have a more heterogeneous learning environment where our students learn from each other, uh, least restrictive learning environments for our students with special needs and really structure our programs in those ways but also build a culture and a mindset within our organization where we have those high expectations and where we personalize the learning experiences for all students not just some. And how do you do that? I mean how do you, how do you make it so that a minority student feels welcome in a school district and believes I need to complete my high school education here. There are two ways to do that. One is we have to make sure that everyone who, who works within the system um, has an understanding of, of cultural differences and, and, and can work with um, students regardless of their cultural background, their racial background, their personal identity, and having an of awareness of just how different our students are and, and appreciating that and nurturing that. So that's an important aspect, but also having the programming in place that allows students to find a pathway that is of interest to them um, and keep them moving in a positive direction where they feel engaged and interested in school. You've gotten a chance to see the community. You've gotten a chance to meet, like, as you said, staff as well as parents. Mm -hmm. Where do you go from here? Because I'm sure that you still want to get immersed in the Quad City experience. Well, it's a very large community, <laughs> as you know. So um, I haven't met everybody. I've um, started my grand tour of, of all the schools and trying to spend as much time as I possibly can. Uh, I'll be scheduling listening sessions uh, at every single one of the buildings so parents can come in and, and meet me face to face. I thought it was very important for my staff to see me face to face and that's why we scheduled those large sessions and I intend to do the same thing with the community and be visible, be accessible and making sure that the communication goes both ways between my office and the rest of the community. Those listening sessions, how would those be held? Are they be held in, in various uh, community organizations or, or how do you hope to do that? I hope to do that in multiple ways. Um, you know, we'll hold them at school if that's convenient for parents, but uh, I've, I've done them in coffee shops, I've been in church basements, I've, I've, I've been in multiple locations. Um, my goal is to get out to the customers. Sometimes my business background language comes, comes back to me, but um, I do treat our parents and students as customers also, and, and I tend to reach out to the customers. Dr. Robert Kabilski, the new superintendent, Davenport School System. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Been a pleasure. Welcome to the Quad Cities. Thank you. Too. And still to come, an invasion of carts in Rock Island. The Grand Prix is revving up for Labor Day weekend. Laura Adams has that and other great ideas you might want to consider if you're going out and about. This is Out and About for August 26th through September 1st. Enjoy a Labor Day weekend festival at the Dan Nagel Walnut Grove Pioneer Village, September 1st and 2nd in Long Grove, Iowa. Period dressed actors demonstrate crafts and sell their wares each day from 11 to 5. And it's time once again for the Extreme Rock Island Grand Prix, August 31st and September 1st in downtown Rock Island. There are a few events helping flood victims, beginning with soprano Lily Arbisser's flood relief benefit recital at Asbury United Methodist Church in Bettendorf August 30th at 7.30. And Bucktown reopens with a wine walk at Bucktown Center for the Arts in Davenport on August 30th starting at 6. Or join Mercado on 5th August 30th in downtown Moline with music, food, and family activities beginning at 5. 
Celebrate artisans at the Iron Grain Fest at the Rust Belt in East Moline, August 30th and 31st. Or check out the Chief Blackhawk Antique Motorcycle Swap Meet on August 29th and 30th at the Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds. There's one more chance to enjoy Circa 21's The Best of the Bootleggers performance on August 29th. And there's still time to catch Circa 21's production of America's longest running play, The Who Done It Sheer Madness. Plus, Quad City Music Guild Youth Chorus holds their auditions August 26th at 4.30. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. Musician Lojo Russo says performing is her passion. She says it's a long, strange, wonderful trip of promise and adventure. And that adventure led her to Moline's Black Box Theater with a performance of some of her original works. Here's Lojo Russo with Undone. I can just touch the sky with the tips of my fingers I can just taste the morning with the tip of my tongue I can just feel the warmth of your breath where it lingers I can just hear my heart beat and know I'm undone Lojo Russo at the Black Box Theater with Undone. She'll be at Grumpy Saloon in the village of East Davenport this upcoming Thursday before heading to Wisconsin for a couple of tour dates. It's been 25 years since the District of Rock Island first roared to life with the sound of racing go-karts. Few would have imagined the race would endure and become a significant part of the go-kart circuit. And few would have imagined it being a Labor Day tradition in the Quad Cities, but that it is. And joining us is the director of the 2019 Extreme Rock Island Grand Prix, Roger Ruthart. Good to see you again. Good to see you. 25 years you've been in it since day one. How hard is it to believe that it's been a 25 year journey? Uh, it's, it's been an interesting journey for, for sure. There's been a lot of ups and downs and twists and turns. But uh, basically, we, we have a great organization. It's sort of like a, a family that gets together once a year for Christmas, you know, and everybody comes to town, does the event for one weekend, and then goes their separate ways again. But great volunteers, great sponsors, you know, a lot of, ra lot of real popular with the racers. So it's been, it's been a good run. See, and I think that's something people in the Quad Cities may not understand. When you think of um, uh, Indy car racing, of course, you think of the Indianapolis 500. For go-karters, Rock Island really is on the map, is it not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, for, um, for the kart, kart racing community, it's, it's like the Indy 500. It's, a, it's kind of a bucket list race that everybody hopes to race sometime in their lifetime. 
And uh, we draw racers from coast to coast, and I think we've had eight foreign countries and 12 foreign winners here over the years. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big deal. Talk to anybody in IndyCar or NASCAR, they've heard of the Rock Island Grand Prix. I mean, that's, that's how big it is in motorsports. See, and that's not the way it was 25 years ago. I mean, you, we were talking a little bit earlier. You think of what the heart of Rock Island was like 25 years ago, very quiet. Uh, you know, in need of a spark of life, and that's pretty much all that you were doing at that point. You didn't think this would be a major tradition that's on Labor Day. No, not at all. I mean, it was. It started at a time when uh, they were trying to create e events for the district to bring people to the downtown. Um, everybody sort of poo-pooed go-kart racing, but when you think of it in, in terms of the growing interest and um, coverage that motorsports has had, and just say, just say that this is applying it at a, at, a, at a smaller, more economical level, it really makes a lot of sense. Now let's talk about the race itself. It's been 25 years in downtown Rock Island. Some people were thinking, hey, let's do things a little different for the 25th. Maybe change the circuit, change the route, or maybe have it go backwards. Not really feasible. I mean, it, it's hard to believe, but this course is there in this shape for a reason. Yeah, it's it's... It hasn't evolved much in terms of that. I mean, we, we're fortunate that we have like a lot of parking lots that are closely, um, you know, closely situated so that we can put all the race teams and the trailers there. We have great uh, cooperation from the city, the Parks Department, people like that in terms of the, using the downtown and, you know, getting our stuff out there. Um, we have great volunteer groups. I mean, the biggest challenge to this event is we, we close the roads down at five o'clock Friday mm -hmm. and by eight o'clock Saturday morning we have to be ready to go race and the same thing taking it down Sunday night I meaning it has to be open for traffic you know Monday morning so that's our biggest challenge is, is finding groups that can help with that um, we have school groups that help we've had support from the operating engineers the teamsters people like that and, and getting us the help we need to do it um, it's a very finely orchestrated uh, chaotic <laughs> evening is what it is. Yeah, it's a ballet of sorts. You're getting yeah. everyone moved in and out right. in just the right way. But you did make changes. It's not just simply making a turn on a corner, particularly on turn one and five. What did you do that's different? Well, we put a little, we put a little bit of a, a twist in there. Our, our course is all left-hand turns, except for one right hand in, right in the middle of it. Um, it's kind of an L-shape. So we... Um, just put a little bit, uh, instead of just turning left uh, onto 20th Street, you kind of have to turn right and then turn mm -hmm. left to get onto it. Because so you added just a little bit of a lip in a there. A little bit of a lip. So you got to do a zig yeah. and a zag. Right. And, and turn one is, is, is significant too because that's the, the, the first turn so the most carts are there. Yeah, when you, when you start the first lap, all the carts get to the first corner roughly at the same time. So that's always the big challenge, getting through the first corner and the first lap. After that, they'll start to spread out and it becomes a lot more manageable, but um, it's, it's still challenging. I mean, we have people that work in those corners or on their toes, you know, if there is an accident, they hop out and move the carts out of the way so it doesn't get worse. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting, interesting uh, race and it's gonna be probably even more so uh, this year. Probably be a little bit of a, of a uh, work in progress the first day to get it set just right. But um, yeah, we're looking forward to it. And I think it'll be much, much more fun from the spectator perspective as well. At the first, uh, um, how do I want to say this? The first year you, you were getting new uh, go-karters, you had grown it into more than 400 go-karters at one point. Then it fell back and it's rebuilding again. How many do you expect this time? Um, we'll probably have, I would say, in the neighborhood of 300 entries this year. So that's, it's very healthy. I mean, it's manageable. 400 was a little, uh, you know, using a shoehorn to get everybody in. Sure, and, sure. and it's more difficult to keep people on schedule and things like that. So, um, you know, if we ever get back there, great. But 300 is a, is a good size for it's us. It's a good, comfortable, manageable yeah. size. What about the, the number of races? I mean, have you added more races? Um, we really have been around 16 or 17 mm -hmm. races. Um, you know, we've, we added, we added a, well, we've, 
broken apart. We have a, one of the interesting parts of the event is, is the vintage racing, mm -hmm. where all the carts are, are from prior to 1984. So you're talking about way back to the 50s too, 50s, yep. 60s, 70s, and, yep. and early 80s. So we've, we've been running a lot of those in groups together, and we're going to separate some of those out this year and, and run them separately. So that'll be interesting. It's, from a spectator's perspective, it's interesting to see how carting has evolved from the original carts to now the, some of the uh, more popular carts. And then, of course, we have the, the top end uh, shifter carts that have a six speed transmission on them and will probably go 80 miles an hour downtown. So. That's a lot of people's favorites, isn't it? Yeah. You, you like to see the shifting, and, and, it, and it just adds a little bit uh, more uh, uh, skill to the entire race, I would think. Well, it, it's, it is, it is. Excuse me. It does. It does add skill. It's um, also the 20th year that we've run the King of the Streets race here, and uh, this year is going to be, I think, very special. We have three of the top five shifter drivers in the country here. We have three previous winners of King of the Streets that are racing. So um, it's going to be. It's going to be. A, it's going to be a full field. So it's going to be interesting. Hopefully, some grudge match going on, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, they race against each other all the Absolutely. time. Absolutely. So. so we want to see something like that going on. Yeah. Tell me about the impact in the community. Um, I mean, we've got an influx of people that are staying through the weekend. Hotels, restaurants, all must be loving this weekend. Well, I mean, I hope so. That was the whole point of the thing, and you know, is to get people into the downtown, put them. I mean, even if they don't go in your business this weekend, they at least see that you're there, and, and maybe you know, come back as a customer later. Uh, I know the restaurants, the bars, you know, the hotels have good crowds, and um, for some, you know, it's a little bit of a little bit of a uh, um, change in what their norm is sure. because you can't Close park right, and can't park right outside the front door and things yeah. like that. But we've tried to work with all those businesses and try and make it as painless as possible. So, um, for the most part, I think it's a it's a great thing for the community. The city's been strongly behind us. Um, the biz the you know, businessmen and sponsors and things like that. And so. you've really made a point of uh, uh, the fact that it is a f it's family entertainment. I mean, the kids love it just as much as the adults. Well, I mean, that's the best thing about it. First of all, it's free. I mean, where, you can go where can you go for free anymore? So we have people that come down and will tailgate all weekend, or we'll have people that will, you know, come down for a while with a pop-up or a lawn chair sure. or whatever. Or you can just walk around. But there's, there's vendors there, there's a car show on Sunday. So there, you know, there's the downtown businesses that are open. So there are diversions and things you can do if you get tired of just watching carts go around for five or six hours, so. <laughs> you can take a break and then yeah, come back. Yeah, take a break right? and come back or go, go look at it from a different perspective somewhere else downtown. Roger Ruthart, the 2019, 25th anniversary of the Rock Island Grand Prix. Good luck, have fun. Oh, we always do. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> WQPT has a commitment to the military families in the cities. So we call it embracing the military. And the U.S. Army wants to help you land a government job. Next Friday, the Employment Readiness Team is offering an advanced resume class open to all military spouses, but also open to all service members, defense civilians, retirees, and their families. You'll learn tips and techniques to help you get federal employment. It's coming up Friday the 6th at 1.30 in Building 110 on the radio, on the air, and on the web, plus on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.